Okay, welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this year's Anton Wilhelm Ammo Lecture of the Martin Luther University Halle Wittenberg, which due to the COVID pandemic is conducted and streamed online for the first time. My name is Olaf Zenka and I'm Professor of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University's Department for Anthropology and Philosophy. I feel also honored to warmly welcome our distinguished speaker tonight, Professor Ayala Chahar. Before introducing her in more detail, however, I would like to say a few words about Anton Wilhelm Amo and the Amo Lecture Series at Martin Luther University. Anton Wilhelm Amo is considered the first and for a very long time the only Afro-German academic. According to Ottmar Ette, biographer and interpreter of Amo's work, Amo was born around 1700 in what is now Ghana and was enslaved as a young child. Via Amsterdam, Amo presumably arrived at the court of the Duke of Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel as a so-called human gift from the Dutch West India Company and was baptized Anton Wilhelm in 1707, named after the Duke and his son. After a thorough education, Anton Wilhelm Amo took up his studies from 1727 onwards at the University of Halle, at the faculties of philosophy and of law, where he completed a first Latin disputation in 1729 on the contemporaneous rights of black people in Europe, entitled De Jure Maurorum in Europa. From 1730 onwards, he studied and taught at the Faculty of Philosophy in Wittenberg, where he was awarded a doctorate in philosophy in 1734. His Latin dissertation, De Humanae Mentis Apatea, is dedicated to the mind-body problem. In 1736, Amo was admitted to the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Halle as a lecturer. Three years later, in 1739, he also taught at the University of Jena. Little is known about the following years. Racist hostility in a mocking poem cast a shadow over Amo's situation towards 1747. During this time, he is said to have left Germany for West Africa. He lived at least until 1753 in Aksim, later in Chama, in southwest Ghana, where his gravestone can also be found today, which records his year of death as 1784. In the 1960s, under the impression of the friendship among nations between the then German Democratic Republic and newly independent African post-colonial states, Anton Wilhelm Amo's life and work were rediscovered and became the object of intensified research at the University of Halle, notably by Professor Borchardt Benches. In 1975, a bronze plaque in memory of Anton Wilhelm Amo was placed next to the main campus of the University of Halle. Since 1994, the Martin Luther University Halle Wittenberg has annually awarded the Anton Wilhelm Amo Prize for outstanding theses. And in recent years, various activities engaging the work in commemoration of Anton Wilhelm Amo have engaged, have emerged within our university. It is within this wider context that the Anton Wilhelm Amo lecture series has been organized since 2013 by the two research clusters, Society and Culture in Motion and Enlightenment Religion Knowledge. This lecture series is inspired by the work of Amo who dedicated himself to the rights of black people in Europe. His criticism was directed at laws that could not be justified rationally and at interpretations of the law that were geared solely to the welfare of the legislators. With his admonition for humanity and jurisprudence, which should always take precedence over strict law in cases of doubt, he proved to be a humanist and an early advocate of human rights. The memory of his person and his work is part of our university's history and thus of its present. It constitutes an urgent reminder that universities must be open to all, regardless of racial, ethnic, religious or other affiliations, free from discrimination and vigilant about power and its many disguises. It is in this spirit that renowned international scholars have been invited to deliver the annual AMO lecture at the Martin Luther University in Halle. Until last year, this initiative was driven with particular verve by Professor Richard Rottenburg and Professor Matthias Kaufmann, both of whom meanwhile retired. Thus, I feel honored to follow in their footsteps as convener of the AMO lecture series. <laughs> 
This brings me to today's distinguished speaker. Ayelet Shachar is Professor of Law, Political Science and Global Affairs and the holder of the Harney Chair in Ethnic, Immigration and Pluralism Studies at the University of Toronto, Canada, where she directs the Harney Program at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Previously, Ayelet was a scientific member of the Max Planck Society and director at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity in Göttingen, Germany. In 2019, she was awarded the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize by the German Research Foundation, DFG, which is considered the most prestigious research award in Germany. Before her recruitment to the Max Planck Society, Ayla Chacha held the Canada Research Chair in Citizenship and Multiculturalism. She has published extensively on topics of citizenship theory, immigration law, cultural diversity and women's rights, new border regimes, highly skilled migration and global inequality, and the marketization of citizenship. Her research is motivated by the need to develop new legal principles to address some of the most pressing issues of our time, how to live together in diverse societies, how to grant rights to those who lack formal access to membership, and how to tame the ever-expanding reach of borders and migration control in a world of persistent inequality. Ayla Chahar has published numerous influential works, including Multicultural Jurisdictions, Cultural Differences and Women's Rights, published by Cambridge University Press in 2001, for which she won the American Political Science Association 2002 Best First Book Award. Other works include The Birthright Lottery, Citizenship and Global Inequality, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2009, as well as recently the Oxford Handbook of Citizenship, published by Oxford University Press in 2017. Ayelet's newest book, The Shifting Border, Legal Cartographies of Migration and Mobility, was published by Manchester University Press 2020. It critically examines the role of territory and new measures of managed migration control in selectively restricting or conversely accelerating mobility and access to the world's prosperous countries. In today's AMO lecture, Ayla Chahar will dwell on and critically explore this new paradigm, the shifting border, and I'm very much looking forward to her talk. Before handing over the word to Ayla, however, two last pieces of organizational information. First, please use the chat to write down your questions for the subsequent Q&A session, which will be chaired by our colleague from the Research Cluster Society and Culture in Motion, Dr. Daniele Cantini. Daniele will then read out the questions to Ayala Chahar during our discussion after the talk. And second, I would like to inform you that, the, that only the lecture part, but not the Q&A afterwards, will be recorded for our website so that you can come back and listen again to Professor Chahar's talk at some later stage. Ayala, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to deliver this year's AMO lecture and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, good evening, everyone. Guten Tag. So lovely to be with you. And I really wish I could join you in person, but it's uh, our second best. And it's a great second best because I see we have many, many people in the virtual room. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. I know people have joined from over 30 countries, including Ghana, which of course has a very close connection to the AMO lecture. So it's a real pleasure and honor uh, for me to deliver this year's lecture, the AMO lecture. And I wanna thank Professor Zanker for this wonderfully generous introduction and also for recounting the reason why we have this particular uh, lecture, the extraordinary uh, life that AMO held and also the deep inequalities and injustices that it reveals. And you also mentioned that um, part of his uh, work was about laws that cannot be justified or that really raise significant questions, normative questions, uh, humanitarian question, cosmopolitan question, human rights questions. And I think within this spirit, uh, the kind of uh, discussion that I will have with you, uh, which draws on my newest book, The Shifting Border, as you heard, Legal Cartographies of Migration and Mobility, um, will be a very fitting um, uh, discussion uh, for this particular legacy. So really, thank you for everyone who was behind the scenes in making this happen. And I'm very uh, delighted to share my recent research with you. I wrote this particular book uh, just before the pandemic. It actually was published literally a week uh, before 
uh, the pandemic took hold in Europe and in North America. And momentarily, I'll, I'll share uh, my screen with you so you'll have my PowerPoint. But just in terms of timing, part of what I'll do in the discussion today is I'll present the book's core argument that's based on the first part of my book. Uh, and then towards the end of my discussion, I will um, uh, not speculate, but I will push forward the argument to explore how these dramatic issues, uh, the change of borders have, of course, become even more important and relevant uh, for our current pandemic age. So let me first uh, share the screen with you and then we can officially uh, begin. All right. Um, so in the short time that we have together, what I would like to do is to take you um, with me on a journey, on a journey that explores how the basic tools of public law, which I'm thinking here about legislation, regulation, case law, court decisions, how all of these have become central um, in reinventing core dimensions of sovereignty in the modern era. And by core dimensions of sovereignty, I'm referring specifically to questions of border control and territoriality. And just I'll move here to my first slide so you could have a sense of what it is that I am exploring. Um, this is the book, The Shifting Border. You can see it uh, on your screen. This is uh, myself in my office. This is the time when we were still in our offices. This is at the Max Planck Institute. And I literally received my first two copies of the book in March 2020, early March 2020. Uh, it was around the 6th of March, I think, that this particular photo was taken. And a week later, uh, the world's borders uh, were closed. Travel came to a halt. So this is the context of my discussion with you. But if we begin more formally, if I ask you now to close your eyes, if I ask you just to clear your mind and think of the word border, what image would come uh, to your mind? What would you think about? I'm guessing that most of us, myself included, uh, would think of the border as a line on a map or as a physical barrier, a firm physical barrier that is attached, planted to the ground or fixed on the territory in a very visible location. So if you want to have an example from the real world around us of what such a traditional border would look like, think about the Great Wall of China, for example. It's a classic example of this fixed, massive, massive barrier uh, that is fortified, that is visible. And it also serves, of course, symbolically as a powerful symbol um, of sovereign control and authority. And this actually operates whether or not uh, the fortification is effective in terms of uh, prohibiting uninvited mobility. It has this uh, traditional function, which is both in that sense functional, but also symbolic. If you want to think about another example of the traditional border, um, think about the Berlin Wall. Of course, that was a visible wall. It was a fortified wall. It ran like a scar um, in the middle of Berlin, in the heart of a divided city, which is actually not too far from Halle, where this lecture would have taken place had we been in person. And of course, we all know that the Berlin Wall was also a violent wall in the sense of border guards that would actually shoot anyone who uh, came to that border or came to its proximity without permission. The walls or the borders that I will describe to you are quite different. They're not as visible. They're not fortified. If anything, they are mo mobile and invisible. But I want to suggest to you that in terms of the violence that they cause, it's not as visible either, but it's absolutely there. And in some ways might be even more violent than the direct walls where we would see the violence occur. So if we're thinking about the Mediterranean, for example, which we'll get to later on in terms of people trying to cross to Europe, especially from North Africa, you might know that the IOM, um, their latest estimate, and of course this is an estimate, no one really knows what the actual number is, they're counting uh, just from 2014, they're assessing that about 20,000 20, people have lost their life trying to cross to Europe. So again, it's not that border guards were shooting them as they reached the physical border. It was the route of passage which they were forced to take, which led to this tragedy. But just going back to 1989, if you recall with the fall of the Berlin Wall, many, many, if you go back to that literature, 
many predicted at the time that closed borders or border walls altogether would become relics of a bygone era. That is, they would no longer exist. No one had predicted that in 2021, we would have a talk about borders. If anything, the thought was that state sovereignty would wane and would become so insignificant that none of us would find it to be a relevant uh, object of research. Today, however, we find a very different reality, both in terms of physical border walls, which, as you know, are built at an unprecedented uh, pace today. And we can talk about that. And typically, they are built on the division between the have and have not, so very specific locations where we can anticipate that these border walls will actually appear. But the other phenomena, which is going to be the focus of my discussion, is the fact that at the same time as we're seeing the proliferation of border walls, we're also seeing a new and quite striking trend that has emerged. And this is the rise of sophisticated, as I mentioned, invisible borders, borders that rely on very sophisticated, shrewd legal tools or techniques to create a whole new conception of the border, which I call in the book, the shifting border. And indeed, this is also the topic of my discussion with you today. And the shifting border, unlike the traditional static fortified border that we have just discussed, is not fixed in time or place. Instead, it's a border that is consistently in flux. It's a border that detaches migration control from a fixed territorial marker. And as I show in the book, one of the most remarkable developments of recent years is the fact that the border itself has become a moving barrier, an unmoored legal construct. So typically when we think about migration or mobility, we would think about humans trying to cross the border. That's our traditional way of thinking about borders and humans uh, interacting with them. But the point that I make or the examples that I will share with you comparatively clearly illustrate that the border itself, the fixed territorial marker of the past is itself moving. And in, a, in many deep ways, our, th our theories and also our responses in terms of human rights responses are still built on that old model and to a great extent are no longer fitting the new reality which we face, which is a reality of shifting border. So these fixed black lines, the black lines that we would see, for example, if we opened any world atlas in whichever language, no longer coincide with the rise of migration and border control functions that may potentially take place anywhere, literally anywhere in the world. And these, I argue in the book, these developments challenge our basic assumptions about either waning sovereignty, that's a traditional post-Westphalian post idea of the demise of uh, states and borders, but it also um, reveals quite, uh, quite directly some of the limits of the nationalist populist push to build border walls. So to a great extent, this challenges both um, the, the most um, prevalent theories that we have about borders, their past, future, and of course, their present. And what I will do with, in terms of the examples that I will turn to momentarily is show that the shifting border is built not by bricks, not by uh, physical uh, barriers, but it's built by legal porters. And in some way, these portals, because they can be applied anywhere or anywhere at any time, in many ways are much more effective and much more uh, dangerous in terms of restricting mobility than the traditional reliance on fences or walls and gates. And once the location of the border is shifting, not only is it a physical change, it's also a change in the technique of governments. And to that extent, it creates a whole new focus and locus of migration control, greatly, greatly expanding the ability of destination countries to try and restrict mobility, especially for unwanted migrants here, unwanted in quotation mark, meaning that individuals that states do not invite and do not wish uh, to uh, have them reach their borders. Uh, especially migrants and asylum seekers, especially refugees and asylum seekers, which have very significant rights that arise if they actually reach the territory. So instead of barbed wire, the shifting border relies on laws admission gates, and that permits the border to contract inward, as I will show you momentarily with an example from the United States. It also expands outward. I'll, I'll use an example from Canada there, but this is a much more prevalent um, structure of, of shifting borders. These borders may appear, they may disappear, then they reappear. And 
all of these changes have very dramatic consequences for the scope of rights and protections that migrants and non-citizens may enjoy. So even if they have very robust domestic, regional, or international human rights, the fact that they never actually reach the territory has very dramatic consequences. And that is partly the work that the shifting border does. And one last point that I will mention before turning to the examples. Until quite recently, uh, the notion of this flexible, stretchable, uh, shifting border and its tentacles were deployed primarily um, to monitor people on the move and especially people moving or escaping poverty, persecution, instability, climate disaster. What we're finding today, and this is really very recent, this is uh, post-pandemic or during the pandemic, is the fact that everyone, including citizens and residents of, of well-off countries, could, it could be in Europe, it could be in North America, it could be anywhere else, um, Everyone, every one of us currently today is subject to the shifting borders ever expanding reach. Even if we remain in our own locality, the shifting border might uh, reach us. And indeed, for this reason, I believe that not only have uh, the pandemic responses accelerated the impact or the deployment of the shifting border, but also it really makes the urgency of my call to rethink uh, our legal and normative responses and democratic responses to questions of how migration is regulated and mobility is regulated ever more pressing. So let's now turn to our examples. The first example that I want to share with you comes for us to, from the United States, and you can see it here um, on our screen. And here I want to describe to you a change, a reform that occurred as part of a major uh, legal change that occurred in the United States. Uh, one provision of that particular change was the introduction of a procedure that's called expedited removal. And this procedure, as I said, was introduced as part of a much larger law. And frankly, from the conversations I had with uh, lawyers that worked at the time, there was very little attention that was actually paid to this particular legal provision. What this provision says, as the name indicates, expedited removal is the idea that this particular provision allows frontline officers um, to remove individuals who reach the U.S. border without permission or without the required documentation, and they're permitted to do this expeditiously. They're permitted to do this very swiftly, very fast. Um, with this introduction, the thought was that, yes, these officers might not have had exactly similar powers, but there was nothing particularly radical about this change. This was true until uh, the very small details or the sm small letters of that particular legal provision uh, were understood and the regulatory power that it authorized became, uh, became visible. And here, the agency which is responsible in the United States for regulating the border, the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, uh, very quickly introduced a regulation which said not only um, can uh, border op officials uh, return individuals expeditiously at the territorial border, the traditional border, they are also permitted to expeditiously return individuals who are tracked 100 miles or detected 100 miles away from any U.S. land or coastal border. So here, if you look at the map, and if you see my cursor here, this is the orange rim that we have highlighted here. This is uh, the United States mainland, and this is Hawaii. The same uh, set of regulations applies. So in effect, what this regulation does is it moves the border from its fixed location at the country's territorial edges into the interior. So that's, again, the orange rim that uh, you're looking at. Now, this legal authorization not only uh, relocates the border, of course, the border, the territorial border remains the same. It's not that the U.S. changed its sovereignty, but the powers of regulating mobility have been expanded to also apply within this 100-mile zone. It creates what is referred to, and here I have an ACLU terminology, it creates what, what is referred to as a constitutional light or constitution-free zone with in the United States. So the 100 miles are literally within, physically within the United States. And then this allows law enforcement agents to set random checkups. These could be checkups uh, that occur on trains. They could occur on highways, on ferry terminals, really any, any place uh, that mobility occurs. And authorities are permitted to ask any random person to provide them proof of their ability or their legal status to remain in the United States. Now, first of all, this might be familiar for you, for those of you who are, uh, say, listening in from Europe. In the United States, this is a very um, extensive power, and most people are not even obliged to travel. You know, there's no national uh, identification card, for example, in the United States. So this is a very extensive power for that particular, pa for that particular jurisdiction. 
jurisdiction. And of course, we are familiar with governmental surveillance of movement and mobility, but traditionally this is restricted quite explicitly to the actual moment of crossing an international border. And what we're seeing here with this example is that these powers are spilling into the interior. Now you might say a hundred miles into the territory of such a large country, how much does that matter? Should we really be concerned about this shifting border bleeding inwards, as I call this in the book? I want to suggest to you that we definitely want to pay attention to this phenomenon, in part because in the United States, just this 100 mile rim covers more than two thirds, where more than two thirds of the United States population actually resides. And many large cities are, um, are, are, are found within this orange rim. Or if you want to uh, cut the, cut the sl slice the data in a different way, uh, we're talking about more than 200 million people that live in this mobile or movable uh, border zone. Now take the state of New York, for example, it lies uh, almost completely within this 100 mile zone. Uh, Florida, uh, down here, uh, fully within um, the 100 mile zone. And of course, these are, I'm, I'm mentioning these two states because they attract a significant number of migrants. And no less significantly, as I mentioned earlier, the Department of Homeland Security, which is the, the agency which is authorized to implement expedited removal, has gone on record already very, very early in the early 2000s, declaring that its interpretation of the law is such that it has border enforcement powers or measures to introduce uh, or to implement uh, expedited removal removal nationwide, meaning throughout the United States. Now, for many, many years, this uh, kind of change was seen as purely uh, belonging to the realm of science fiction, because it obviously would imagine if all of this is orange, it absolutely blurs the distinction between the exterior and the interior for border enforcement purposes. I do want to report to you that actually um, this particular regulation was introduced by the Trump administration, and this was actually done before COVID. So just to give you a sense of the shifting border that even its own reach within a particular country may expand or shrink. So let's quickly move to our second example, just in the interest of time. Here I'm going to report to you about a different procedure, which actually comes from my home country of Canada. The shifting border here stretches outward. And Canada, um, for its part, has really perfected the technique which Canadian officials call the technique of interdiction abroad, which effectively means that Canada, as a country which most people fly into, just given its uh, geographical location, uh, Canada has effectively relocated much of its immigration regulation activities to overseas gateways. Uh, these could be located in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, wherever um, people travel or, or want to embark a plane towards Canada, you will now find uh, immigration integrity officers. Sometimes they are called liaison officers. They are usually not uniformed, so you would actually not know that they are officials. They would guide airlines and airline personnel uh, to conduct border control activities in those uh, faraway overseas gateways as a matter of course. And of course, if, if this is done, if your your regulation of or your or your, your documents uh, for international travel most frequently now will actually be regulated and screened by an airline personnel person, not by a government official. You won't see them until you actually reach the territory if you manage to board the plane. In effect, this means that a lot of questions of accountability of responsibility have been delegated to third parties and they're non-governmental in the sense that they are non-state actors, but here not in the humanitarian sense, but in the sense that if you were stopped and you believe you should have been permitted to travel to Canada, say to make an asylum claim, you have very little remedy. You have very little uh, recourse given that you have never really been stopped by a government agent. So the idea here of the shifting border is that instead of being regulated here at the land border, when you actually reach Canada, the idea is to move the border out, to shift it outward, ideally to the outer ring that you see here the country of origin. So if earlier we've seen the border uh, bleed into the interior, here what we're seeing is precisely the reverse. The border is stretching out. It stretches out well into the territorial frontiers, well beyond the territorial frontiers of Canada. And indeed, as I mentioned to you, this is part of an official policy, a, a shifting border strategy, strategy that uh, as official uh, government documentations would openly declare them. The idea is, and I'm quoting here, to push the border out as far away as possible from the actual territorial border. So this is, again, the notion of instead of allowing people to reach uh, the territory, the idea, and this is endorsed now by governments literally throughout the world, is to screen people 
here at the country of origin or at the source of their journey. And you might know that the European Union has been a very active player and in, in again, trying to uh, adopt this idea of regulating migration at the source or origin of individuals' journey rather than at the end of the journey. That is when they reach the destination country. And what is even more interesting, because you see the various rings here, the idea is that when a person, once you begin your international travel, uh, you would be regulated again and again and again at every checkpoint along the travel continuum. So this could, again, mean prior to arrival, it would mean visa screening, as you see here, it would see the airline check-in, point of initial embarkation, transit areas, point of final embarkation, arrival at the airport or the seaport land border, and only then will you actually finally reach uh, the country. So the idea is that instead of uh, being regulated once you're on the territory, which countries have seen this as operating at too late a moment to actually prohibit your ability to move, the idea is that all of this will occur prior to arrival. And if we need to formalize this, we can think about this as um, instead of the traditional static border, which used to be the first point of regulation, this now becomes the last point of encounter. And the same logic of the shifting border I want to report to you proved very instrumental when the pandemic broke out. So, for example, the Canadian government literally, um, uh, once it became clear that there is no way to contain the virus to any particular region or country, uh, the response, the governmental response in terms of regulating the border, which occurred in mid-2020, uh, in March 2020, um, was to invoke the shifting border. That is the way in which this was done was to introduce a global travel ban, which came into effect on March 18th, 2020. In fact, it's still with us today, this global travel ban. And more specifically, what Canada did was it used its ability to screen people from abroad before they actually board a plane and before they reach the country. They've introduced the same mechanism, but just implemented them on a much larger scale. So any person seeking to travel to Canada was subject to this regulation. This also includes citizens who um, uh, were barred from traveling to their own home country if they showed any COVID-19 symptoms. So this is, again, it's an escalation of a technique which is already there, but was now used uh, writ large. And this is partly the pattern that we have seen not only with Canada, but many other countries as well, as we will see later on in our discussion. But again, it means that the decision, the crucial sovereign decision actually of who gets in and also who will be permitted to have a full asylum hearing now happens at foreign transit hubs. And these are located frequently tens, hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from the actual territorial border here, the Canadian border. Um, so this is uh, by way of information. I will get back to these uh, points later on, because now not only do we have the regulation occurring prior to mobility, so prior in time and also uh, far away from the actual territory, we also know that current regulations actually also require us to show if you're traveling internationally, you need to show a negative uh, test. And without that, a negative COVID, negative COVID test, without that, you're not permitted to board an international uh, flight. So uh, these uh, kinds of patterns, again, are building on the ability of states to ask you to report ahead of arrival. Many people have to show where they would actually reside once they're in the country. Again, all of this occurring before you have any direct contact with the destination country. And of course, expanding the reach of that country's ability to regulate uh, mobility. And we can expect, and we know that now there are very, the, the talks about the European digital uh, green pass uh, are very advanced. We expect that to see implemented, uh, potentially um, some of the statements have been sometime in early to mid June. So literally in a couple of days. We know that that would actually permit to open up travel within the bloc, which is something which is very important for the European Union, understandably so. But if we look at this from a global perspective, it would also mean that unless a person is vaccinated or is recovering from COVID and can prove, uh, bring medical proof to show that or has a negative test, if either of these uh, conditions are not met, individuals will not be able to travel. And as you may know, the global data is such that if we are looking for the number which um, 
typically a, an epidemiologist would look for is 75% of people vaccinated in a country to say that indeed it can open up. If we look at those current rates, people are saying it would take years, literally years. It could be four, five, six years until globally we reach that number. If we look specifically at India, it will take 10 years until that country in current rates of production will reach that vaccination rate. So you can see why if we're looking globally, these concerns about uh, unequal uh, ability to move mobility inequalities are likely to be exacerbated rather than reduced by this particular pandemic. But just turning to my third example, I'll get back to these questions later on. I want to share with you one last example from the book. And this example comes to us from Australia. So if you look at the screen, Australia even more explicitly and more dramatically than Canada or the United States has officially relocated its borders through the words of law creating, as the government readily admits, a distinction between the country's uh, migration zone, which is what you see here highlighted in the very bright yellow uh, color on the map, and Australia as we know it on the map. And again, I, I just to emphasize, Australia still has exactly the same sovereignty. It hasn't changed its, its borders in the sense of the international law. It just changed the implementation of where migration control or, or regulation can occur within its own domestic territory in those uh, yellow bubbles. Now, this this particular policy is called the excision policy. It was introduced through legislation. So this was actually in that sense public, uh, introduced in 2001. These regulations were later changed. Uh, the legal regulations were changed in 2005 and then again in 2013. And what this legislation uh, does, what it permits uh, Australia's immigration officials is to remove asylum seekers, asylum seekers that have actually managed to reach its now exceeds uh, territory. So if someone has arrived by boat anywhere here, legally, they are treated as if they have never reached Australia. Now, of course, this is a legal fiction. Individuals are actually there physically, their body is there, they have reached Australia. But technically, legally, what excision does is it says, well, you have never legally, you're not here. You might physically be here, but we don't recognize you. And this particular legal fiction um, significantly limits the procedural and substantive rights that asylum seekers and other irregular migrants uh, are, t are otherwise entitled to, again, even in Australia under its domestic law and certainly under international law. And what it also does, and again, this is just to show you how dramatic the shifting border has become, it also attenuates, it limits, or really in, in Australia, it actually el eliminates altogether the possibility of uh, judicial review of turning to the courts. Um, so here it's not only redrawing the territorial border, it's also attenuating, it's changing, it's redefining legality in the process. And in 2013, the last legal change that occurred with this particular policy, the excision zone uh, was expanded again through legislation. And now it includes the entire mainland. All of Australia now should be in this bright yellow country. In effect, the border now applies everywhere in Australia and nowhere at the same time. And I just want to mention to you, of course, given this hardline policy, um, someone, individuals, um, the, 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 the intended policy is actually to have people, less people arrive to Australia based on their knowledge that they will not be able to be processed in Australia. But it still uh, leads us to the question of what happens to those individuals who actually did reach Australia. Physically, they're there. We said legally they're not. But what happens to them? And here, Australia came up uh, with the process, the, the, the policy that some of you might be familiar with. That's referred to as offshore processing centers. So individuals who reach Australia, if you look at this uh, element of the screen, they might reach Australia, but they, their claim will not be processed in Australia. Instead, they would be transferred to Nauru, a tiny, tiny island a nation in the Pacific, or until Papua New Guinea resisted, its Supreme Court actually said Australia cannot no longer put people there, uh, which is a very important decision, actually, but by the Papua New Guinea um, uh, highest court saying it breaches uh, Papua New Guinea's constitution. So here, actually, a transit or a, a country that's used as an offshore center saying we will no longer uh, cooperate with us. It's a very, very significant uh, moment. But at least uh, under Australia's policy, the idea was that people will be offshored. Their claims would be processed 
elsewhere. And again, at least under Australia's policy, the idea was to deter human smugglers uh, and ir irregular migrants from reaching its shores. And uh, this excision zone uh, for the individuals who reach it really does become a black hole or almost something like an original sin, because even if their refugee claim is proved to be credible, legitimate, and recognized, they will still never be able to go back to Australia, just to give you a sense of how significant the shifting border is in that country. I also want to mention uh, this to you, because um, at least there are some discussions now in the UK post-Brexit of uh, ideas of saying, why don't we learn from Australia in the sense of interjurisdictional borrowing and introduce something similar in our jurisdiction, so people who might reach the UK physically, uh, if the UK adopts something like an excision policy, it probably will have a different term, um, might be again offshore. And the question is, where would they be offshore to? That is not at all clear. You need to have to co cure the cooperation of, of what in European uh, jargon would be third countries. So I just want to show you just moving here. I won't have time to talk about Europe. But if you look at the migration routes to Europe here from Africa, you can see how they really occur throughout the continent and partly the response of the EU now, uh, especially post 2015, the long summer of migration or migration crisis depending on your perspective. The attempt is now to stop people not here, not when they reach Italy or Greece, but actually long before they actually depart. So the same idea of tackling migration or really stopping mobility at the source. Again, it requires a tremendous amount of cooperation with uh, different countries, the local countries, and we can talk about that later on, about the kind of negotiations that are now um, occurring. Uh, I also... Just before turning to my final part of my talk, I want to suggest that in the book itself, I propose several uh, proposals, several ideas about how we might respond to this new reality of the shifting border. And I suggest it really does require a major legal and political reimagination of how we think about mobility, how we think about territoriality. What I have here is actually an image of the Nansen passport, as you know, uh, which was one way of thinking about these issues prior to the introduction of the 1951 Refugee Convention. So that's just uh, one point uh, of, of thought. But again, we can discuss this in the Q&A. Just turning quickly to the final part of my talk. I want to uh, discuss with you some of the changes that we have seen in borders in the time of COVID-19, as you see it here in the slide, uh, in the title of this slide. And to a great extent, what we're seeing is, of course, the return of um, a very heavy use of, of border of mobility regulation, both internationally and within countries, and in some cases, subnationally. So for those of you who are in Germany, you know that the, 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 the different divisions within the country became much more significant. The same was true in Italy and Spain, also in Australia, Canada. So all of a sudden, these provinces or Lander, all of a sudden, they became meaningful in a, in a way that no one had predicted they would be as significant. But under these extreme conditions, we have actually witness that. But to a great extent, if you just want to have the data, remarkably, this is from March 31st, 2020. At that point in time, this is what we now call the first wave. Um, the immediate response was to close the border. And we know that close to 200 countries at the time imposed either full or partial travel bans. And as I mentioned, some of these travel bans are still with us almost a year and a half later. And de facto, what these countries did is they engaged in self-closure or self-isolation. Again, not social distancing, but this occurring not at the individual level, but at the national level. And what the countries did is they had different techniques. They either banned inbound travel or outbound travel. And in most cases, uh, actually, most countries did both. And at the height, or at least at this point, March 2020, at the end of that month, and this is also true in April 2020, we saw 90%, 90% of the global population um, uh, was residing in countries that were um, under these travel restrictions or under these uh, mobility bans in response to COVID-19. And this, from what we know about human history, recorded human history, is absolutely unprecedented. And again, I say this mostly as, as a descriptive fact, uh, not, not here being evaluative. It's just uh, a different way of understanding mobility. And no one, if you had asked anyone in February 2020, could this even physically occur? Is it possible to stop mobility given how deep globalization um, has occurred, uh, the kind of interdependence that we have? Um, the thought was, no, this was 
impossible. We now know it is actually possible. Although I should note that you know that trade and commodities actually uh, were able to uh, cross borders uh, much more freely than individuals were. But once connectivity was seen as the major source of transition, many countries uh, immediately used the idea of blocking the border. But for our purposes, the more interesting question is, how was this done? How was it actually possible to bring mobility to a halt in a world which uh, was so dependent on mobility uh, previously? And of course, we know that the different countries use different measures. They used emergency measures, emergency powers, and legal rules, but all of these were had to be, at least in, in rule of law countries, introduced through legal uh, measures. And what is interesting for us to note is that none of these legal limits actually followed any kind of the traditional understanding of the border. So we didn't see border walls built. You could not do this in one day. Uh, you definitely did not see soldiers move to the border. You didn't even see any sack of cement moved to a fortification to actually make a physical border. So clearly it was not the old border that was operating here. Instead, what governments did is they deployed, as I mentioned earlier, the key rationales of the shifting border idea of, of the idea of regulating mobility from afar. And they did this uh, first by blocking travelers prior to arrival, that is before they embarked on a plane. So very similar to the technique I've described to you from the Canadian example. So before uh, people actually uh, were able to reach a country, they were blocked. And also, and this, so this we actually are familiar with from the traditional use of the shifting border as externalizing the border. But what was also uh, new and, and again used quite extensively, at least earlier on, was the idea that um, not only would incoming travelers be regulated before arrival, both temporally and spatially, but also they were regulated after they reach a given territory. So even if you were able to travel, you pass that negative test, et cetera, still once you arrive, and this is still true in most countries, you will actually be subject to a quarantine. And this again is a quarantine that in time might change. It could be 10 days, it could be 14 days, um, but you will be located, you would be blocked to a specific location and tracked, at least in some countries. So the example I have here of this wristband comes to us from Hong Kong. And this particular wristband is actually um, uh, connected to a GPS that's connected to your smartphone. There's a special app that does this. And this occurs post arrival. So let's assume you reach the border, you cross the border, you're now in Hong Kong, you're going home. If you're a resident or a citizen, or you're a traveler, you would go then to a hotel room. The minute that you get there, you have to walk and let's assume it's our hotel room, you just have to walk through that space. And then that is recorded and you will be mandated to remain within that space, which is now your digital geofence has been erected and you have to stay within that physical space. And if you move beyond that, you will be, first of all, you would be notified that you are now breaching a rule. Secondly, there would be a significant fine. And in some countries, in fact, in many countries, even in uh, highly reputable democratic countries, you might also be subject to criminal procedures if you do this. So this post-arrival uh, regulation is something new. We have not seen it used, definitely not as extensively, definitely not universally as it is applied now. And that leads me to the next question, which I will just uh, take a few minutes to close on this, which is what does the future hold for international mobility? And of course, we're in the realm of speculation. And I must admit, just like you, anyone else listening to us, I don't have a crystal ball, but I believe we can actually look at the past and use that to predict some of the um, expectations or some of the uh, expected moves that governments would deploy in the near uh, future. And this is especially significant now as governments, many governments are actually contemplating some partial reopening and a return to some degree of, of, of mobility. We said free movement within the Schengen area, uh, but also there are discussions about creating international bubbles of mobility. And we want to think about how this might uh, be done. So as, as I mentioned earlier, we already know that the vast majority of countries, uh, even prior to the vaccine, have required a medical certificate that shows that you have a COVID-19 negative test uh, for international travel. Most likely this will continue. This has to be done 48 or 72 hours prior to your departure. So you actually have to uh, time it uh, correctly. Uh, the question that we don't know yet is if vaccinated individuals would be subject to the same set of regulations 
or if once a person is vaccinated and can actually uh, bring proof of that, most countries would ask two doses of the vaccine plus 14 days before one can travel. Uh, but if you have this either as a physical evidence or a digital evidence, that uh, would likely uh, permit you to travel again. We're not sure if you would have to be tested yes or no prior to arrival or, or upon arrival. Um, but this is something that is likely with us to stay. This is a requirement to actually show a tremendous amount of, 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 um, of evidence about you your physical health, about the state of your body as the moving body across space, and that will be regulated in new ways. And just to give you a sense of, um, of how the shifting border might be connected to different uh, to these new developments, but also drawing on past experiences, I just want to give you two examples of um, pro proposals or processes that were already underway prior to the pandemic, but again, have already accelerated and are likely to accelerate even more in the wake of COVID-19 and its aftermath. So you might know that governments in a whole range of countries in a whole number of countries have actually been uh, exploring the idea of uh, travel, which would be paperless uh, travel. This is what government officials, and this is really different countries are here. I'm thinking about China, the United States, Australia, the United Kingdom, the United Arab Emirates, Singapore, just to mention a few examples. Uh, government officials in those countries have uh, been imagining or foreseeing a future whereby both arriving and departing uh, passengers will no longer require any travel documents. So our passport, the physical passport, will become, uh, according to this notion, a thing of the past. And instead, what would replace it? So you could think about a digital version, but even more interesting, interestingly, and, and I think more definitely more important for us if we're thinking about Amu's uh, le legacy of thinking about laws and, 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 and the kind of impact they might have on individuals and also how they might differently impact different groups of individuals. So questions of inequality here. But the idea is that our body will become our ticket of admission or conversely, it will become uh, what marks us for denial of, from entry as biometric borders uh, expand their reach and expand their impact. And just to make this a little bit more concrete, I have an example here. If you look at the image, this is an example from Dubai's International Airport and it's Terminal 3, which is their international arrival and departure um, uh, terminal. Um, they've already, already introduced a pilot project that's referred to as, it's a new biometric border. It's referred to in that airport as a smart tunnel. What does this smart tunnel do? You would walk through that tunnel. It would have different images that are moving. Now I have here this image of, of a city. Typically, you would have fish moving, which our eyes naturally are drawn to looking at the, that movement. It's, it's actually not volitional. You, it's very hard to control it. And if you are to look at those different walls of that smart tunnel, there are 80 cameras which are embedded into those smart, uh, into this smart tunnel's walls. And as you walk through it, uh, these cameras uh, would actually, um, depending on each particular airport, which technique they want to use, it could be an iris scan, it could be face recognition, but this kind of screening of your identity occurs without any human interaction. There's no password. You just walk through this particular tunnel. At the end, you either get a green light, you can move, or a red light, then you are stopped. And then most likely you actually will go to a secondary review. There you would probably meet a human rather than just um, a smart border or a biometrical border. And just a great example, and I'll close on this, uh, there's just one other uh, ex uh, really pilot test that has already been introduced again prior to COVID. We can expect to see more of these experiments occurring post-COVID. And this is actually an experiment from the European Union. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's really quite futuristic and in many ways unnerving. This is a, t a pilot project called iBorder Control. And eye border control is a very sophisticated high-tech system. It's an artificial intelligence system, which is designed to pre-screen incoming travelers. And it currently, it, it only is volitional, and it only applied with, even at the pilot uh, stage only to non-EU citizens or residents. So the idea was that if someone wants to travel to Europe, they would be required, and again, I'm quoting here, to perform a short, automated, non-invasive interview with an avatar and undergo a lie detector. And these eye border controls, so you would have that initial screening. Then th this eye border uh, control, this 
AI machine uh, is tasked uh, with the responsibility of, first of all, verifying your identity, that you are who you claim to be, but also, and this is more significant, to calculate a cumulative risk risk factor for each individual. So you would have your risk factor determined by the uh, algorithm that's used by this particular AI machine. We don't actually know precisely what goes into those decisions, and that's very significant in terms of democratic accountability, which is currently clearly lacking. But what is even more significant for you as an individual traveler, once that risk uh, factor has been determined, it will appear in any future border crossing, any time that you seek to move, even if you are already within Europe, you might uh, face these eye border control. These little machines are, are small. They could be put on a train, for example, where legally there is authorization to check your identity when you're traveling in Europe. So again, that particular risk factor will remain with you. And this uh, machine, uh, which is trained specifically to detect uh, human uh, deception, human lies through micro gestures, these again, subtle, very subtle nonverbal facial and bodily cues, uh, these, uh, this, these little units can then again determine whether or not you'll be permitted to move within a region, which at least formally has free mobility uh, as, as one of its core values. So just to give you a glimpse into this future, to some extent, the dystopian future, which we need to think through, we need to explore how we might respond to it, given that our current tools are really, in that sense, pre-shifting border. They are not yet um, adjusted to this new reality and this significant expansion of governmental authority in terms of regulating mobility. So the territorial border, just to wrap up, um, is not just shifting inward and outward. It's actually multiplying. It's fracturing. And each person, literally each one of us, might in the future, carry the border with us as we move through across space and place, given that our body indeed will become the border itself. And I want to close with the following thought. As these examples uh, have demonstrated or illustrated, uh, borders are not vanishing. So the story, the post-Westphalian vision of, of bygone uh, borders uh, clearly has not materialized. If anything, we're seeing borders that are proliferating and are also dramatically transforming. And this shifting border that I've described to you is at times multidirectional, it's slippery, but not in the transnational, open, tolerant variant of demise of the state or post-Westphalian uh, theories as, as those theories had predicted. Instead, what we're witnessing is a darker, a more restrictive orientation that has emerged. And far from the dream of a borderless world that has emerged after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Today, we find not only more border walls that are erected on the global fault lines, uh, but also the rapid proliferation of movable legal barriers, barriers that are applied selectively, unevenly, with fluctuating degrees, intensity, and frequency and of regulation. So no longer a static barrier, the border itself has become a mobile, agile, sophisticated, and ever-transforming legal construct a shifting border. And this border, as I mentioned, can be planted, replanted in different location with very significant implications, mostly negative implications for the rights and protections of everyone who falls um, under its remit. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to stop here because I want to keep some time for the Q&A. And I very much look forward to hearing your thoughts, suggestions, comments. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing here. And I look forward to the Q&A.